We're continuing our series on connections. We're talking about the fact that we were created for community, that we're wired for relationships, that we're made to go through life together, and, and we're formed for a family. As a matter of fact, the Bible says it's not good that man should be alone. It is our goal that we are deepening the sense of love within our church family, reaching out in love to the community around us and the, the family that we have here at Line Area. We want to reach out. We're learning to, to build stronger relationships in our church and reach out in our relationships with love to those around our church. And the reason we're doing this is because the Bible says that we are better together. We are wired for relationships. And again, God said in the garden, it is not good for man to be alone, and it's not. And so we, we, we're, we're wired for relationships. God hates loneliness. So he wants us to be in a community with each other, and that's why he gave us a church. We've been talking about this cross-connection, the idea of connecting with God, connecting with each other. Now, two weeks ago, we looked at why we need each other, and if you missed that message, I would encourage you to go back. We have the YouTube. You can see our messages on YouTube that we had, and, and, and talk about the idea. You remember I, we started out the thing saying, look at the person next to you and tell them, you need me. And then we said, then look at that person and tell them that I need you because we do. We need each other. And so what I'm going to be talking about for the next few weeks is building on that particular lesson. Now, we may not realize it, but the people you're sitting to next to, you are connected to. Now, here's the problem. It's easy to get disconnected in relationships. I mean, would you agree with me? I mean, it's, it's very easy to get connected, disconnected with your children, with your parents, from your brothers and sisters, from, from your family, your husband, your wife. If you're married, it's easy to get disconnected from your church. And so today, we're going to look at what causes that and, and how can we fix it? Why do relationships fall apart? Why do relationships go bad? What destroys relationships and how do we rebuild them? That's what we're going to be talking about today. Or how do you build new ones? How do you prevent relationships from going bad? And so if you have a pencil, you might want to write these points down because they're not going to be up there. Uh, <laughs> Romans chapter, it's not his fault. I may not have dropped that in the drop box. Uh, Romans 12 and verse 5, it says, So in Christ we are many, we form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We belong to each other. Let me tell you what destroys relationships. Number one, selfishness destroys relationships. Someone told me seven years ago that the root of most sin is selfishness. You think about it. I mean, why does someone commit adultery? Well, because he's trying to meet his or her own needs. Why do we lie? Well, to cover up our mistakes so that we can make ourselves look better. What's the heart of materialism? Well, we, we desire to have more things. We want to have what we want, and we want to outdo everybody else. Someone said about possessions, you know, that in our society today is, you know, get all you can, can all you get, sit on the lid and poison the rest. We want to outdo everybody else. The problem is, is we want to, you know, we, we want to outdo the Joneses. The problem is when we catch up with the Joneses, they refinance. And you know, so, you know, you never can. And so we're trying to, you know, but, but it's selfishness that does that. And so we need to understand that. Yet, what do all these acts have in common? They hurt and they often destroy relationships that we have with others. Now, bring this line of thinking into the church. Selfishness is the root of all sin. And it stands pretty well if you think about it. I mean, you know, someone complains because the worship is a little different. It's not wrong. It's just, you know, not their style. And someone will say, well, you know, I didn't get anything out of worship services. You know, that is a very selfish attitude when you think about it. You know, you're really here to worship God, so it's not about you. And you're here for each other. We're to encourage one another. And so someone to say I didn't get anything out, number one, 
you, you don't have the right mindset. Number two, it's pretty selfish. And the reason you probably don't get anything out of it is because you have that selfish mindset. You're not thinking about what you can do for other people. You're thinking about what you can get rather than what you can give. You're not willing to give to God, and you're not willing to give to others. Then, you know, it's just, mainly it's just, you know, I just want what I want. And, and we'll cause a stir if we don't get what we want. Somebody gets mad and leaves over a decision that's been made. Was anything wrong with the decision? No, I just didn't get my way. Difference of opinions over Bible matters. And by the way, we do have different opinions over Bible matters. As we talked about Wednesday night, I gave you a, a litany of different things that that we might not necessarily agree with on a brotherhood. And I ended that by saying the fact that you will not find two people in this church, let alone in the brotherhood, that would agree on all the different topics that I brought up on Wednesday night. We just don't agree on everything. And that's okay. A person will turn away from a person who's been friend for years because they didn't agree on something. And that's a shame. There's a word that I hear a lot of times from God's people. Me. Yet when I look at the one who we serve, I see another word. Others. We need to get that word down. In James chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, it says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Do they come from your desires that battle within you? He says, You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. Our question this morning is, what destroys relationships and what builds them? Selfishness destroys relationships. Selfishness destroys relationships, but selflessness builds them. In Galatians 6 and verse 8, For the one who sows to the, his own flesh, will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And then he says in Galatians 5, 16, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. My flesh wants what I want. I mean, we're all guilty of that. Our flesh desires things. You know, we want what I want. We, we want to get it when I get it. We're in an age where, you know, we're standing at a microwave going, hurry up, hurry up. You know, we, we can't stand it. You know, we, 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 we can't go into a place because we want to go through the drive through Why? Because we're in a hurry. We don't want to make any contacts. We want to get things done. And the problem is, is that creates some, pro uh, some problems within our relationships. But selflessness destroys that. Selflessness is, selfishness is of the flesh. Selfishness, selflessness, I'm sorry, is of the Spirit. And because I'm one who no longer lives according to the flesh, I need to day by day put away the things of the flesh. I need to day by day begin to live in a greater way for the Spirit. Count on the Spirit to transform me in that respect. And one of the results of that transformation will be Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. Each of you should look not onto his own interests but also on the interests of others. As members of the body here, we can hold on to what we want and do the things that we want to do them and the way we want to do them, and as a result of that, we will hinder the growth of others. Now, we can maintain a selfish attitude and hurt our relationship, and it makes it hard to maintain that relationship or fail to be able to develop relationships altogether because our attitude is one of, you know, it's my way or the highway. It's let's do it this way. Or, or, you know, I want it to what's pleasing to me. And we can lay, on the other hand, we can lay down our own lives, deny ourselves, become selfless people, and as a result of that, we'll be able to develop relationships with others, and it'll help us enable to keep and grow in our relationship with them and with God. So, Selfishness destroys relationships. Selflessness builds relationships. Number two, pride destroys relationships. I mean, how many things have pride cost us in our life? A promotion because, 
you know, we didn't t accept the promotion because we knew we were number two and not number one on the choice. And, and so if we couldn't be it, we wouldn't take it at all. An opportunity to serve because no one asked me to help. Now, I hear this a lot in the church. Every year I hear this. Well, nobody asked me. Well, what I want to encourage you to do is to talk to the ministry leaders until they use you. We have all kinds of ministry leaders in this church, and, and, and we need your help. And that ministry leader may not have, you know, he, he may have his plate full, and he might not be a good organizer. So what you do is you go pester him until he finds you something to do. But if you sit around and you wait until someone comes to you and says, oh, you never asked me, and you say, that's the reason you don't do anything, well, then you need to change your attitude. That's just pride. You know, we, we, we've got this sign-up sheet. We filled it up, by the way. Thank you for those that filled it up. But I wonder how many, you know, if we'd have gone and asked you personally, we, the, the, but there, was, there wasn't that many slots to fill. I love it when someone says, I'll do that. Put me down for this. Isn't that awesome? But so many times, I know we could have filled that thing double if I'd have gone to people personally and said, would you do that? But that's a shame. We shouldn't have to. We should have a spirit within us of humility and desire to serve. But oftentimes our pride says, no, they're going to have to come to me first. We need your help in our ministries. Proverbs 13.10 says, pride only breeds quarrels. And quarrels are something that we want to avoid at all costs. We want to be a unified body of believers whose actions are based on love and glorify God. This is such an important responsibility. John chapter 13, 35 says it this way. By this, by what? You'll find out. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. How? If you love one another. Think about all the things that Jesus could have said here. All men shall know you are my disciples if you are a follower, if you attend every service, if you give a lot of money, if you dress nicely. But he chose to say that the world will know that you are my followers if you love one another. What a witness we are to other believers and what a witness we are to the world when we love each other and we get along with each other. That's what makes the church such a wonderful place. I read a story about a preacher. He was talking to a guy. The guy said, you know, I had to, he, he was talking about this idea of pride and how it destroys relationships. And the guy after services came up to him and says, you know, I had to confess to you. You hit me tonight. He says, I've got a brother that I haven't spoken to for 30 years. He said something, and I made a vow to never speak to him again. And so we don't speak to each other. I remember attending a church where there was a family that sat on one side and a family sat on the other, and they hadn't spoken to each other in 20 years. But this guy tells this story, 30 years. What destroys that relationship? P-R-I-D-E, pride. Our question this morning, what destroys relationships and what builds them? Pride destroys relationships. Well, what builds them? Humility builds them. 1 Peter 3.8, finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate. And here's that word. And humble. Philippians 2.3 and then verses 5 and 6 says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Let me give you the rest of that story. Didn't finish the story about what the preacher told that man. He told him, says, you know, you really ought to give that guy a call, your brother a call. You hadn't poked him in 30 years. You really ought to be the better man. Give that guy a call and, and make sure you give him a call. And so later on, the guy comes back, and he tells the preacher, says, you know, I got a call out of the blue two weeks later. He said, the preacher said, he said, it was a man from the meeting. He said, I called my brother, and when I spoke, he recognized my voice, and he said, my brother began to cry. 
he began to weep. He said, we talked for hours that day. And he said, preacher, this next week we're going to meet together. And, and, and I just wanted to thank you. What destroyed that relationship? Pride. What put it back together? Humility. You can go through life and you can be a part of this church and you can maintain a proud attitude and as a result, you will destroy a lot of relationships. Or you can be a person of humility and build relationships. And there are those here this morning that need to be humble. You need to humble yourselves. And there may be some of you here this morning who may need to resolve some issues that you've had with somebody. And it may have been a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, 20 years ago. But you need to mend that relationship. You need to humble yourself and say, you know what? It's not right that we're not together. You need to take it back. You need to build relationships. I encourage you to be the one that takes the first step. Pride destroys relationships, but humility builds them. Another one. Number three, insecurity destroys relationships. I mean, Genesis chapter 3, verse 10, actually starts at verse 8. He says, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord. This was after Adam and Eve had, had sinned and, and Jesus is walking in the garden. They know he's coming. They know they're sin. They know they're guilty. It says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Now, what we read there is the dawning of insecurity. What leads to insecurity? In the case, in this case, and in many cases, since not having faith to know about the relationship, what we have in a relationship with God that will take care of us. They didn't, they were insecure whether or not God was really going to accept them now at this point. And as a result, we doubt and as a result, we create our own way, and we do our own thing. Adam had God to take care of him and meet his needs, but it wasn't enough. He desired more. Man was designed to walk in a relationship with God, and we get away from God. One of the byproducts of that mistake is insecurity. Adam said to God, I was afraid. I was afraid of what you would think, what you would do to me, I was afraid of the fact that you would be ashamed of me. Insecurity leads to the same thing today. Why is he always calling me when I miss services? Sometimes, you know, we'll do that. You know, somebody will miss services, somebody, why is he always calling me? Why would he call me? I mean, after all, his kids are just wild as a haint. We'll put it off on somebody else. You know, we'll put it off on them. Who is he? In other words, who is he to call me? We get insecure, and we start shifting blame, and we start getting you know, in our own security. You know, he had preached a lesson and taught a lesson on, and boy, you know, rather than, you know, that got on my feet, it was, well, there's some things he needs to work on too. By the way, there's some things he does need to work on. I've had people come out of a sermon, and it's amazing to me. I can preach a sermon, and, and, and literally there'll be someone who will come up and say, that's the best sermon I ever heard. Man, you hit me right where I live. And then you'll get somebody else to walk out and say, that is the worst sermon I've ever heard. And they'll tell you too, by the way. They'll tell you when they don't like it. Well, I didn't get anything out. You know, they, they'll let you know. Now, what was the difference? Two people, same sermon, heard the same words. Oftentimes it's guilt. Sometimes it's insecurity, uh, like, like we're talking about here. The fact that we sometimes don't do what we should do and then when someone checks up on us, makes sure that we're okay spiritually, that leads us not only to not appreciate that gesture oftentimes, but it leads us to try to find something wrong with a person's life who's trying to point it out. Don't we do that? That's because of our insecurities. This is a type of behavior that destroys relationships. 
But if I accept the security that God provides, can't we see how we're able to treat each other as we should? Because we're secure, we'll be less prone to be judging. We'll be less prone to being angry with others, more tolerant with those who aren't where we are or at least see that they are where we are. Proverbs says it this way, Proverbs 29 and verse 25, the fear of man brings a snare, but whosoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Our question this morning is what destroys relationships and what builds them? Insecurity destroys relationships, but love builds it. Look at 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not made, been made perfect in love. In, in 1 John 4, 15 through 17, he says, Whosoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God provides, uh, abides in him, and he in God. And we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this way that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. And in 1 John 4, 20 and 21 says, If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God in whom he's not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Are you secure enough in your relationship with God to love your brothers and sisters as you should. It's amazing. You know, if you're secure in something, somebody come up with you and, and, and what some other person might perceive as a criticism, it just goes right past you. Why? Because, you know, you're secure. You know what you're, you're, you're not trying to prove anything to anybody. Uh, you know, uh, you're, you're, you're secure in Jesus' love. You're secure in what you're doing. You know, if you're doing whatever you need to do, you shouldn't worry about it. And there are those that you need to begin to extend love to, though. Insecurity destroys relationships, but love builds them. Love builds, and, and that's what we're all about. We want to build relationships in this church. We want to be like Jesus. You know, we said our, we exist to live and love like Jesus. Jesus loved you where you were. He was secure in where he was. He, 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 he was humble enough to lay his life down for others. He was humble enough to serve and to be, rather than to be served. He's a great example of relationships. There's a poem. I want to I end with this poem. It's called The Builder. I'll just read it to you. It's an unknown author. It says, I watched him tearing a building down, a gang of men in a busy town, with a ho-heave-ho -ho and a lusty yell, they swung a beam, and the sidewall fell. I asked the foreman, are these men skilled as men you'd hire if you had to build? He gave a laugh and said, indeed, just common labors is all I need. I can easily reckon a day or two what builders have taken more than a year to do. So I thought to myself as I went my way, which of these roles have I tried to play? Am I a builder who works with care, measuring life by a rule and square? Am I shaping my deeds to a well-made plan, patiently doing the best I can? Or am I the wrecker who walks the town, content with the labor of tearing down? Do you build relationships or do you tear them down? Are you a builder or a destroyer? Listen, if you expect the world, and by the way, young people, you might want to get this down. The world does not revolve around you. We're not here. Your parents aren't there to be for your every need. And the quicker you learn that, the quicker you're going to be happy in life. And the more you're going to be a builder, a builder of relationships. This morning, we want to build, help you build a relationship with God. If you believe in Christ, if you're willing to turn from your sins, if you're willing to confess your faith, be baptized for the remission of sins, you will be added to the body of Christ, and, and you'll be a new creature. Your sins will be washed away. You will, you'll be added to Christ. 
I love the description he gives in Romans chapter 6. He said, you're united with Christ in baptism. You're buried with him, and you raise again to walk in newness of life with him. And you start that relationship, and then you build. You, but you start with him. You'll never build relationships out here until you start up here. So you need to start there. And if we could help you this morning, I want to encourage you as we stand, we offer the invitation.